I think we'll wait for a couple of more minutes. Um, I think tomorrow is a holiday, so maybe <laughs> we might not have many people. I think I'll start in about a minute. Am I audible? Just want to check. Uh, can can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Cool. Thanks, Bara. Um, okay, so I think we'll just start because, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many people may come or may not come. Uh, all right, so I'm hoping all of you have gone through week five's lectures. And uh, I just wanted to clarify um, one of the questions that was asked the previous time. Somebody had a, a I think a couple of you had a question on whether calcium is a... Um, is important for cell division and is an integral part of the cell wall. I think this was a question by uh, Manjusha. So, yeah, just a clarification for that. I've just taken a um, screenshot from our text. Uh, so, actually, calcium is used in the formation of calcium pectate, which is an integral part of the cell wall as well. And it also plays a role in cell division. So uh, this is taken from the transcript of the lecture itself. So when you have a plant that cell that's dividing into two cells, calcium pectate will form a layer that will separate the two cells or the two daughter cells. And uh, uh, calcium is also a really important uh, element, or uh, a really important uh, element in uh, that helps in cell communication as well. And it helps in, uh, especially in the calcium channels that allows for transportation of uh, um, molecules from between cells, actually, across the cell membrane. So that was a clarification from the previous lecture. Um, uh, moving on to um, questions from week five. So this is the first question. So, a population's dash can be defined as the number of individuals per unit area or volume of a habitat. So, is it the geographic range? Is it dispersal pattern? 
is it the population's age structure the population's density or the population size you can uh, either unmute or please feel free to use the chat box now since there are very few of you all of you have to talk all right so krish says d uh, aparna says d anyone else ma'am d density density okay yeah anybody else feels it is something oops other than density everybody feels d all right great uh so yes it is actually d it is so when you have a number of individuals per unit area so that per unit area gives you a clue of what it could be and it has to be anything a uh, number of individuals per a unit of area taken is called as density um so uh, wh what is different in uh, the other factors would someone like to describe what is geographic range dispersal pattern age structure and size what is the difference between population density and population size could someone tell me that if we are considering the number of individual mm -hmm. in okay. a habitat yeah amul uh, give me an, give me give us with an example any example but you can go ahead explain the number of, if we are considering the number of individual mm -hmm. then uh, calculating the number of individual in a population mm -hmm. then it is called uh, size right. of population Right. but if we are limiting this population by a unit area aha uh -huh. it is called as density of that population right in the age structure we are considering the different age group mm -hmm. that is pre reproductive age group reproductive age group and post reproductive age group right. in a population called as age structure right and what about uh, dispersal pattern and geographic range anybody else would like to uh, um take a shot at explaining so geographic range is easy right geographic range okay so i can explain geographic range is basically the area uh or the habitat that is occupied by a particular organism right so for example i'm studying um like for example uh the geographic range of perhaps the lions in gir is restricted only to uh gujarat and that portion of gujarat only so it has a very small geographic range right but if you take the geographic range of another widely spread organism like for example a macaque or something like that the geographic range is large it spread all over india right you see the monkeys rhesus macaques all over india yes uh, rashidul did you have a question uh yeah sagar Sagar and Rashidul, did you do you have a question? You have raised your hands. I don't know if that's accidentally or not. So that so this basically uh, defines what is geographic range, right? And then you have dispersal pattern. Dispersal pattern is basically how far an organism moves from its uh, natal territory. So what happens is that um, like let's say for example a bird. let's just take um, a bird that has uh, a pair a male and female bird that have made a nest and then have many uh, chicks and then from those when those chicks hatch and they become older they disperse from their natal territory natal territory is where they are born right 
so usually in birds it is believed that females disperse further than males so females go way outside to find new territories whereas males more, more or less often uh, dispose to territories that are adjacent to their natal territories which means where they were born so that shows like dispersal patterns of these organisms right but most importantly uh, let me ask you a question do you think uh, size is do you think density is variable population density is variable yes exactly yes it is variable and why is it variable uh, due to the natality mortality rate immigration immigration uh, yes because of environmental factors ma'am Yes, environmental factors. It can be emigration, uh, migration, any biological activities, any behavioral patterns. So density can differ. So you can have a population size that is fixed, which is the exact number of individuals. Uh, suppose there are a hundred lions in Gir, but if I take the population density, if I take the entire area of Gir, the population density is a value. But if I divide the entire area of gear into uh, grids, I might find certain grids have uh, lesser density of lines and certain grids have more density of lines, right? This depends on the amount of space or area that they occupy or they are clustered within, right? But the population size will not change because it is like an absolute value now there are various measures to also determine population size we'll cover that later all right uh, so that's the, yeah someone had a question sorry uh, who is speaking I missed out. I think somebody had unmuted and was talking. Thomas. Uh, all right. So the second question. So what does this figure represent, and uh, what is the reason for such a distribution? So you can take a stab and uh, guess as to what this figure represents. Any ideas? Different biogeographical regions, maybe. Uh, in different biogeographical regions, not really, right? I mean, it's kind oh, of just kind of it. Uh, well, not really, right? You're not seeing the exact patterns. Yes, it could be. Uh, let Let's say. Let's say this is a continuation of our previous question. Does that give you a clue? So we it depends on the climatic regime. Ah, uh, sure. This uh, well, if it is climatic regime, then and population distribution. Yes, yeah, it is close. Yes, population distribution. Ah, uh, okay. Let me give you a hint. This is population dis. It's population density actually, but can you guess of what population density of photosynthetically active region, madam? Ah, uh, no, not really. Well, they are all interlinked, but um, okay. So I'm going to reveal. So this is a human population density map, right? and uh, if you can see like india and this region of china are dark darkly represented because this is like the key 
so I, this is this very small but this is uh, yeah this is 50000 and more this is population per kilometer persons per kilometer right and uh, why do you think these areas so the so the lighter shaded areas are the areas that are less inhabited so could anyone give me the reasons why these are less inhabited this is the human population density map it is linked to what several people also did mention what do these okay let's say what does this region look like in africa sure yes geographical area or this region in australia if you can see the entire australia has no human population except yes amazon forest, yes, yes, amazon forest. Uh, yes you have the amazon forest where the amazon forest do have some population of humans but like if you see australia like for example uh yes climatic va va variation true uh but what about this this area in australia is kind of like quite close to the equator right it's warm it's tropical why are there new humans there why are there no humans here okay i can understand there are no humans here because it's why are there no humans here tell me on the top mm -hmm. due to deserts no? yeah exactly so these are all the deserts right this is sahara desert uh, a huge part of australia is barren because the land is inhabitable because it doesn't have any resources to support human beings staying there that's why they live so close to the coast and it's clustered right so there are various factors as several of you also rightly identified that affect population distribution and population density of humans though humans are known to inhabit every single surface on the earth there are areas where the population densities are very low right all right so uh Tell me why is it important to assess population density of animals? So I think you already did mention what are the factors that can affect population density. But yeah, go ahead and like list some up. Why is it? Why, why do we need to assess population density? Why is it so important? No answers. Just for fun, why are we assessing population density? It gives an idea about the increasing population or decline population, and also gives the idea about the availability of resources, utilization of resources. Sure. Yes, that is a very valid point. yeah uh regulation of population okay ranul says to it need be know which areas to protect sure okay uh krish could you uh, explain a little bit more on regulation of population so we can uh, maintain the density thereby we maintain the entire uh, ecological balance right so what do you think we should be doing with humans Man, can't I can't understand? Oh, what what should happen in the case of humans if human population density is shown to be expanding everywhere? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, uh, populations can be regulated. So uh, I don't think so much in our country, but um, in other countries, like especially the US, uh, when populations of certain like top predators are very high. they open these national parks for hunting and culling so they have uh, legal allowances for culling animals to actually bring down the population numbers of certain organisms that are exceeding the limit right 
and uh, yes it is definitely very important to know population density so that we know which areas to protect because uh, as we had discussed just before uh, populations uh, like the population size is can be something but the number of uh, individuals of a particular species occupying or clustered in a particular habitat may vary across the landscape so if it is found in a particular habitat type in a region then those habitat types must get preferences for protection so yes it is it is very crucial to understand and assess population density in animals this is along with population size and every other uh, demographic parameter on right uh, so um, so this is a fill in the blank so there is the a particular effect see a particular effect that describes a scenario in which populations at low numbers are affected by a positive relationship between population growth rate and density which increases their likelihood of extinction so to break this down uh there is a particular effect that occurs uh, when populations are at low numbers and it increases their likelihood of extinction and this is because there is a positive relationship between population growth rate and density so normally what would you what would you see uh, as the density increases your population growth rate should what should happen uh no not increase right yes shabir do you have a question or everybody is today randomly raising hands so usually what happens is when the density increases what happens tell me the factors that uh who is this uh so um tell me the factors that affect yes correct less space to live exactly so when density increases your population growth rate ideally in a normal scenario decreases right but this particular effect shows a positive relationship between population growth rate and density right so when the population is uh low the growth rate also becomes low so this is a particular term does anyone know what this effect is called um no one yes correct it's called the alley effect would you like to explain what is the alley effect it will explain the relationship between the uh, population size mm -hmm. and the interactions mm -hmm. right sure uh but uh, in this in the alley effect what happens is that uh, you have a positive relationship between population growth and density this means that if there is a low density the population growth drops so you would imagine if the density is low there would be ab an abundance of resources so the population growth the population should increase right but why is this not happening why is the population decreasing if the density is low there's so many resources there's so much place to stay uh there's so much of space but why is the population not increasing why is it decreasing this is seen in a particular uh type of organisms as well and this is seen in social animals right so for example um there are let's take for example the example of dholes 
right those are wild dogs that hunt in packs okay now they need a certain number of doles to bring down a prey right one dole cannot go and catch a cheetah but you need about like 3 to 4 or even more i'm not exactly sure of the number but you need multiple individuals to strategize and hunt down a prey right so if the density of doles itself is low they won't be able to catch any prey though the prey are abundant and their population growth rate automatically declines right is this uh, is this clear and this is what is called the alley effect all right does anyone have any doubts in this if not i'll just move on okay so it is the alley effect that describes this scenario okay so what does this image uh, represent out here what are the scientists doing out here and in what cases are such techniques used so let me give you a hint it's a sampling technique cardboard flip uh no <laughs> this is not cardboard flip okay so these are like uh frames through which they are doing some sampling quadrat method yes correct it's the quadrat method so uh when do you use a quadrat method for sampling in case of abundance density to meet yes absolutely correct so when there is a huge density of uh, organisms that you are sampling i think in this case they are uh, sampling an intertidal uh, coastal area and they are collecting some mollusks or so it seems so they use these quadrats and lay them out in uh, different areas either via random sampling or some other technique and they sample all the organisms within that quadrat only rather than covering huge amount of square kilometers of area right all right next question so in a heterogeneous population the population is divided into sub populations which are internally homogeneous right and when you do this this kind of a sampling technique is known as random sampling systematic sampling stratified sampling or multi stage sampling all right this is one answer for c any other guesses ma'am can i try yes yes sure ma'am it's simple random sampling okay why do you think it's random sampling okay somebody says systematic sampling okay Okay, why random sampling and why systematic sampling and why uh, what was the other choice? Stratified sampling. Anyone would like to explain these three kinds of sampling? uh right so ranul says because we have subgroups so stratified yes okay uh so let me explain stratified sampling so out here the keyword is in a heterogeneous population heterogeneous means there are many different uh types of species or whatever is present the like heterogeneous is mixed so they are divided into sub populations which are internally homogeneous So suppose I have a vegetation. Well, suppose I'm sampling vegetation in a matrix of like grassland, for grasslands, forests, and then uh, timber plantations, right? Uh, I will divide them into blocks that contain only grasslands, only forests, and only plantations, and then I will go and sample. So that is called stratified sampling, right? Systematic sampling basically means that 
I am choosing where I want to sample. So suppose I have a complete area, I have graded it up into multiple grades and I say I want to sample, I'll sample this, 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 this grid and this, 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 this grid, right? This is all in layman's terms but just so that to give you like an overview. This means systematic sampling when uh, the, sam the sampling sites have been completely chosen by you, right? And random sampling means like you just randomly sample any point or any grid, but you can do this via various computational methods. They can you can just say I have about a hundred grids to sample, a hundred grids available. Of these hundred grids, I have to sample randomly sample ten grids. Uh, you can run an algorithm which will uh, show you which of the grids, which of the ten grids you should sample and they can be randomly distributed in your population. And different sampling techniques are used for different studies to answer whatever your hypothesis is, right? Um, all right, so next question. Okay, so bit of pen and paper work or calculator work. Hello. Yes, someone. Uh. Madam, uh, previous question, the last option is multi-stage sampling. Yeah, multi-stage sampling is when you have multiple layers to the sampling technique. So you can maybe uh, stratify your sampling techniques, that is like the first layer. You divide them into subgroups that are internally hom homogeneous. So you have like grassland and show, uh, forest patches. And then those grassland and show, uh, forest patches, you grid them up and then you do some random sampling within that right so that becomes multi-stage sampling where is life okay. yes sir. Yeah. all right so now for some pen and paper work uh, you need to find the population size of a particular butterfly species on a small island and for this what is the technique that you will use is a particular method that you will use. Uh, you need to tell me what this method is called. So using this method, you catch 90 butterflies on day one, right? You catch these butterfly species and you paint a white cross on their wing. And yeah, Amul? Pan trap. Pan trap method. Pan trap method. <laughs> You're just walking mark around. And recapture. Yes, that is correct. It is mark and recapture method. Yeah. So uh, what you do is you uh, you go on day one with a butterfly net and then you catch around 90 butterflies and you paint the white cross on all these 90 butterflies. Then you sample after seven days and on day seven, you uh, take your butterfly net and you go out and you catch 80 butterflies. Now this, oops, there's a typo here. Uh, this included, so the, if of the 80 butterflies you caught, 16 of them had white crosses that were marked on it. So given the information provided, uh, could you all uh, calculate the population size of this species? What is the population size of this species? Uh, there is a formula to calculate mark and recapture. I hope you all know the formula. B, okay, one option for B. So all the numbers are given to you, right? You have population that was caught and marked in the first instance. And then you have total number of, uh, so you have total number of butterflies caught on the first instance that were all marked. And then you have the total number of butterflies that were caught in the second instance of which a certain number were marked. Right, okay, so Abana says C. I need some more answers. 
do this. So apart from two people, nobody <laughs> is calculating. This is very easy. You can use your phones to calculate. Shabir, do you still have a question? Because I'm not sure why your hand is raised. Uh, anyone else? Any answers? Are you calculating? You have to give, tell me that you are calculating or you don't know. Or you are looking for the formula. What is it? Tell me. All the others? Are you looking for the answers or are you calculating or would you like me to tell you? Am I not audible anymore? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm guessing uh, you are not familiar with the formula. So let me say Aparna is correct out here. Aparna, would you like to explain to everyone how you calculated the population size? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, in the first, uh, 90 butterflies are uh, cached. And uh, 90 upon 10 we can consider is equal to the butterflies which are total captured are 80 in uh, second case uh -huh. and out of which 16 are marked. Right. So uh, 90 upon n is equal to 16 upon 18. Uh, 16 upon 18 or is it 16 upon 18? Yeah, I think you are correct. So uh -huh. when you bring it, yeah. Got it. So, n is equal to 450. Yeah, alright. That's the correct answer. 90 into 80 divided by 60. So, here you have animals marked and released uh, in the first instance divided by the estimated population size. Marked and released as a per hand. 80 divided by if you put this this side, yeah, if you put this this side, you'll have uh, 90 into 80 divided by 15. So, what are the drawbacks of using a metal? Like, someone tell me, what are the drawbacks to using a any ideas as to why, what are the drawbacks of using such a method? Um, Ma'am, it uh, never gives the exact or actual uh, population size. This is the drawback. Uh, sure, but why will it not give the uh, exact population size? What are the factors? So, what are the assumptions in this? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we are assuming that the population size is constant, uh, but uh, it is never constant. 
Sure, constant in the sense of uh, the numbers. Uh, sure, but uh, constant in the case of you, you would think that there is no immigration and emigration, right? So no. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So no individuals <laughs> leaving the population. Neither are there any individuals that are uh, adding to the getting into the population from outside, right? So that yes. is, yeah, Ranul. Uh, yeah, just I was saying that uh, it might also be possible that uh, the ones that we are marked, uh, the marked butterflies, they might die because they have a very short lifespan. Yes, sure. The number of uh, some of the marked butterflies could die, uh, and uh, so the new butterflies that are added to the population are the unmarked ones. Sure. And then what could be another problem? So let me give you a hint. I'm painting a white cross on their wing. What could be another problem that could hamper my results? Predation. Uh, wings break, man. Sure, yes. Predation definitely can occur. Um, wings can break off, yes. The white mark might also come off, right? The paint might, paint this yes, might wash off. And you might... In fact, if I caught 80 butterflies, actually all if all 80 were, uh, it could also be possible that all 80 were marked, right? But the paint had gone off and I'm getting like a wrong estimate. So there are certain drawbacks to this, but there are certain advantages also to do studies that involve mark and recapture, but they have to be very, very systematic, right? All right. So next question. So out here, you have an example of a pitfall trap. And uh, what do you think they are used to measure? Population density of what? Okay, you have to guess the organism. Madam? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, it's actually, yes, insects. And why do you think this is the right choice to catch insects? Um, uh, Shabir, your voice is uh, breaking. I'm not sure if it's my internet, which is also highly likely. Yeah, I can hear you, Shabir. Madam, madam, because uh, they uh, insects are mostly uh, because uh, they have a nocturnal behavior, madam. Uh, mm, I might not agree with you so on and, that. To have insects that are active in the day and night, but uh, sure. So what's that? How does so, the trap work? What is it actually doing? So because so they try to so. Madam, they try to uh, avoid direct light. Sure. Yes. And that is why in the process they just go try to take move inwards and inwards and ultimately okay. they fall into the uh, into the uh, container which contains some uh, some say uh, some preservative in the, in a solution form and. Sure. Yeah. And that's why how they are, uh, how they are then, uh, uh, the container is kept undisturbed, say for 24 hours or so. And then after that, uh, we see, we take the uh, container and sample the ins uh, whatever the orthopods are there. Okay, right. And by that, we are able to estimate the abundance. Right. And so what happens to these insects once they fall into the trap? Madam, because the container it contains some say some solution which is a preservative which is in a, so they remain uh, they just die off, uh, they die off and but yeah. remain intact, madam. Yeah. But yeah. they're uh, yeah. So that is I mean, they do not undergo they do not undergo decomposition, madam. Yes, yes, correct, correct. Yeah. 
so you can use like various solutions like you can use alcohol you can use a mix of alcohol and people use also soap very often to so that these insects can't fly out there are also straps that use uh, some sweet substance like some juices or some honey or something solution there are also traps that use um what do you say some carbon emitting source because carbon attracts insects to uh to it so yeah there are various sources but yes this is a pitfall trap uh, that is used in measuring population density or even population diversity of insects yeah all right so next question so here you have a figure showing four population demographics for age structure okay and you have to tell me which of the following graphs best represents a country with a fast growing population structure so i don't think you can see uh, the uh, numbers very clearly i'll just explain it to you so at the base you have uh, like 0 80 and then you have age 25 and then you have age 65 <laughs> and this is showing you the population density on the x axis and the y axis is the age a population is increasing population a population okay uh okay c okay oh a okay another answer for uh, another choice for a yeah okay Then B. B, okay, but <laughs> right. So, uh, this is a very fast-growing population. Okay. So that should give you a clue. A. So, would someone like to explain to me why A? Uh, so, A is the correct answer, and why it is A? Uh, because pre-reproductive age group is more, mm -hmm. it will be converted into the reproductive age group, and so the population is increase. Right. So there are a huge number of people that are uh, in the zero to twenty-five age group, right? And it's a very fast-growing population, which means that the age group from zero to twenty-five, the density of individuals from zero to twenty-five is much higher. So can you tell me what is actually happening in uh, C? It might be steady population. Sure. And what is the difference between A and uh, C? The pre-reproductive age group and the post-reproductive age group might be same. Mm, okay, the density is relatively same, but if I look at uh, the yeah. rate of rate of natality and rate of mortality is equal. Hmm. So, what is the difference between the rate of mortality and nat nat natality in A versus C? Uh, <coughs> okay. A versus me. C. Yeah. Tell me. in case of a natality rate is more mm -hmm. mortality rate is less and in case of uh, c both natality and mortality rate is approximately equal sure and if i am talking only about the age group above 65 what would you which man uh, above 65 so the orange part Okay. What would you say about the birth rate and death rate? I mean, let's say death uh, rate, obviously not birth rate. Natality rate is less in A, and uh, natality rate is more in C. Ah, uh, yeah, not natality rate because that will be here. And so mortality. Yeah, mortality. Mortality. Yeah. 
So in yes. the mortality rate is very high, right? Because you see a very low density because this shows density. The width shows your density. But the mortality rate is very low in C, so that you have a large number of individuals above the age of 65, right? And this and this both are kind of like an aging population or a saturated kind of population. And you also have populations where the birth rate and uh, the age density of people between 0 to 25 is lesser than the uh, density of people above 65, right? So that is called an aging population. All right. Okay. Decline population. No? Sorry. Decline population. Yeah, declining population and also like an aging population where the number of uh, older people exceeds the number of the, uh, the, what do you say, younger people, right? But they live for a longer duration. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so, next question. Oops. Okay, so you have a figure out here. Uh, tell me, uh, oops, uh, which of the following figures describes high precision and low accuracy? You have graphs out here to also guide you through <coughs> your possible answers. Oh, I didn't actually mark these. So you can tell me top right, bottom right, top left, bottom left, whichever you feel is the correct answer. So this is top right, bottom right, top left, bottom left. All right. So Bilal says top right, high precision, low accuracy. Any other answers? Bottom left, all right. High precision, low accuracy. What are the other answers? Anybody feels that? Top right. Okay, top right, another for top right. Mm. bottom left okay so two for top right two for bottom left okay uh, so in the interest of time i'm going to reveal the answer the correct answer is yes bottom right we have somebody to break the tie uh, so tell me why is this the correct answer and why not this can someone explain both these graphs to me Or should I do it in the interest of time? Yeah, go ahead. In in first one, mm -hmm. that is top left, mm -hmm. the high precision and high accuracy is there yes. uh, because the reading are uh, very accurate to the central point. Okay. That is perfect one. Yeah. What's happening here? Top right. Here the <coughs> here the precision is. Yeah, the correct precision answer, is yeah. low. Go ahead. Precision is low, and uh, accuracy it might be uh, come the mean is equal to the uh, correct reading. Mean is equal to the correct reading <laughs> because the. Yay. So the so so you have more number of points that are close to the bullseye, right? So you yes, ma'am. Yes. Which one is the correct answer? Yeah, this is the correct answer. High precision and low accuracy. But this is high accuracy, low precision. Because all, the spread of the points is a lot, right? So if I am yes, putting arrows, they are all hitting different places, right? So my precision, my aim is not good. But my accuracy 
of being close to the bull's eye is more here because i have 1 2 3 4 5 6, 6 points close to the bull's eye and two points really far away but out here my precision is like excellent because i have all my points in one place but my accuracy is like totally off the center so i have low accuracy here right i'm not close to the actual target but i'm very precise in my shots and out here yes, there is like low precision and low accuracy so i am off target and my shots are not clustered also right yes ma'am all right next question stats question a statistical measure relative uh, measure of the relative dispersion of data points in a data series around the mean is called A coefficient of variation, B standard deviation, C standard error, D weighted mean. B, okay. A B. A. Okay. B A B A. What else? B Any other answers? uh okay so in the interest of time uh the answer is a it's actually coefficient of variation i think probably in the next class we can do uh, all the formulas as well in case you are not familiar with them but the answer of this is a so since we have more questions left i'm going to skip to the next one uh so this is a fun one so which species needs to be additionally marked to estimate population size via the mark and recapture method out here Is it A jaguars, B humpback whales, C meerkats, D Malabar giant squirrels, E Bengal tigers? You can choose more than one option out here. So tell me which organism slash organisms need to be marked additionally to estimate population size by the mark and recapture method. any answers okay i'm getting confused with if anyone has replied let me just type all right a and e okay a and e jaguars and bengal tiger need to be additionally marked all right uh, any other species any other guesses come on If anybody is not familiar with the animals, actually, I should have put pictures of these animals. Meerkats are small uh, mammals that are found in Africa. Uh, you usually see them like scurrying around, and they have the sentinel kind of behavior where one person looks out and one of the individuals looks out, but the rest of them are foraging, and they are uh, found in large colonies. Giant squirrels are also small mammals. Jaguars are big cats. Humpback whales, large marine mammals. Bengal tiger, yes, all of you. Only one answer. Hmm. Okay, so we have run out of time. So I'm going to give you the answer for this. 
so it's actually uh, C and D, right? Because Jaguars have uh, E. Okay. Okay. So let me tell you why it is not E. Uh, Bengal Tigers have got what? They have got stripes, right? And these stripes are unique to every tiger. So all tigers have a, a particular unique uh, pattern that helps uh, them to be identified individually, right? And similarly, jaguars have certain spots or they are called rosettes, which are certain patterns that are found uh, very characteristic at the individual level. And similarly, even humpback whales have certain markings on them that are very, very characteristic to them, to an individual, right? But meerkats and giant squirrels don't have particular individual markings. So you need to put some markings on them to uh, estimate population size via the mark and recapture method, right? Because um, they either like spray paint them, not really with like some particular dyes, or they put some paint or they actually put like hair coloring also like i uh, you know in meerkats they put uh, hair dye in certain regions of the meerkats to help them being identified like either on the tail or either on behind the back or on the head or certain regions right but they do it in such a way such that it doesn't interfere with the ecology of the organism Right, so the answer is actually C and D. These two organisms need to be individually marked. All right, so I think we have already overshot time. Does anyone have any questions? No questions? Uh, all right, then we can close this session. So thanks for coming. I have a couple of more questions that we can probably cover like later on or during our final uh, review session. But uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who joined in and see you next week.